wonderful gal, honestly. I am honored, and the idea that I stand as your next introductee with Michelle Obama makes me incredibly proud. So it's great to see so many friends and my family, Doug and Susan McLean in the back row. Um, I, I feel as though I'm coming home to the Plymouth area Democrats. And some of you will remember why. This sitting literally right here was where I feel my first campaign started because it was the first debate of the primary in 2010. And I walked in nervous. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. I wasn't sure who I was going to see. And now I look around the room and see all these incredible friends and all these people that I've met and have worked so hard for the values that we all share. And I was very proud to be on the ballot with so many of you in this room, incredible people. And I'm really thrilled that so many of you are running again and taking this on again because our country needs our help, but our state needs our help too. And so you've got a great ticket. Um, I'm grateful to Paul for introducing them all so I won't have to acknowledge every single member in the room, but um, just know that we in Concord are really, really appreciative that Grafton County is just going to rock the state in the uh, in the next <laughs> But this is quite a bit of responsibility. Um, it's actually the whole country that is going to be looking to New Hampshire, looking to the New Hampshire Second District, and looking to Grafton County to make a difference in uh, the makeup of the United States Congress going forward and in who sits in the White House. And that's really, honestly, not too strong of a statement because with the students that you have here, with the students in Hanover, with the people working at the grassroots, with all of the folks that you can turn out. I just have to tell you, I had an amazing experience a little bit earlier this evening. We drove over from Hanover, and to come over Orford and Mount Q and see a sea of blue and white Democratic signs <laughs> was history in the making. I just want you to know. So we're going to get this done, and our country can rely on. Uh, let me tell you, you know the story about 2010. Um, I had 3,551 votes that um, were, we were shy of winning. And I want to tell you I'm grateful for every vote that we did get. But at this point, um, I'm actually going to take a little break while uh, this person steps out. And I'm sorry, this is about civility. And I can explain to all of you. Um, I'm going to take a leadership role in this, in this election on civility. Some of you are going to hear a story that's in the news about me being accosted by a person from the Bats campaign, and this young man that just came in with the camera was here to um, photograph this, and I'm grateful that you have your own photographer, and this mic is with New Hampshire Public Radio, so I just want everybody to be aware that this is the environment that we're in and that I'm going to take the high road and I appreciate all of you having having my back with that. So <laughs> thank you very much. Um, it is about civility and it's about civil discourse. But as Val said in her introduction, what it's really about is responsibility and taking responsibility for our government, for our lives. This is what New Hampshire is about. You know, granite state values mean something in our state. <clears throat> they mean opportunity, but they mean fairness. It means not that the government provides all the solutions or that the private sector provides all the solutions, but that we work together. We literally roll up our sleeves and get things done. I love coming in here to the Senior Center. And Phil just pointed out to me that it, it, this incredible building actually was made to look like a, the inside of a train. But think of the history in these creaky floors. Think of the people that came through here on their way to the North Country to see the beautiful mountains and to stay in our incredible hotels. And the farmers that were bringing their, 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 their wares to market. This is where people came together. And I cannot think of a better symbol 
for what it means when we come together and take care of each other. And when a community like Plymouth, like all the little towns that you represent, come together and take care of each other. I'm not talking about bigger government. I want lean, efficient, effective government. And I've said repeatedly that we should not spend any tax dollar unless it's spent wisely. It shouldn't be spent at all. But we do need to take care of one another. Congressman Bass is taking votes in Washington that do not represent the values that we share about opportunity, about responsibility, and particularly about fairness. And I'm gonna walk you through just briefly, because you've heard a lot about it already, but the Ryan budget that he has now voted for twice. Once before he voted for the Simpson Bowls and once after he voted for the Simpson Bowls. In fact, if you listened to our debate the other day, I said, Congressman, you voted for it within 24 hours. And he said, I voted for the a half hour after, as though he had no shame about having a backroom. If he believed in Simpson Bowles and he believed in that approach, stick with it. But he doesn't because he sold out to the Tea Party, and this is where we've ended up. So you've heard the part about Medicare, dismantling Medicare as we know it, and the voucher system and the voucher care. And this won't work on radio, but I'll use my little, my little chart here. This is the voucher, this is healthcare inflation, and the delta in between is the part that you're gonna pick up, $6,400. But here's the problem with that approach. There is no $6,400. Look around at us. Look around at our lives. The average Medicare income is $23,000 per year. So the $6,000 doesn't exist. And here's the bottom line. Unless we're going to be a society where we're literally stepping over each other in the streets, <coughs> and we're not because we're compassionate, so what'll happen? People will show up at the hospital. They fall, they break a hip, they'll go to the hospital. You have a wonderful hospital here with a compassionate policy about taking care of people when they arrive at the emergency room. So they'll be treated. And then what happens? You have cost shifting because the hospital has to pay the rent and turn on the lights and pay the, the wages. And who pays? We all pay. And this is what David Axelrod has called the death spiral of the healthcare system. Because what happens next is that all the small businesses around town see double digit inflation again in their healthcare premiums for providing health insurance for their employees. And so they can't afford it. So first they say, I'm sorry, we can't afford to have you and your whole family. And then they say, I'm sorry, we can't afford to have any of you. Or your copay is going to be $2,500 uh, your, your, before you reach any, any relief at all. And so what happens? More people are uninsured, more people show up at the emergency room without coverage. So just think about that next time you hear about the voucher, next time you hear the Republicans talking about the future of Medicare. Because they will not only dismantle Medicare, but our entire healthcare delivery system will have a big sucking sound. That's the worst part, but it gets even worse from there. And here's why. What I believe in, in terms of getting our economy going again, is that we need to invest in opportunity today for prosperity tomorrow. Education, I couldn't be in a better place to talk about education because we all believe in it here in the Plymouth region. But we need to invest in people's lives so that they can do the jobs of the 21st century. Any job, go into the auto mechanic, you've got to know computers to be able to work on the cars. Today I had a wonderful tour at a company called Hypertherm over in Hanover, incredible company, 1,300 employees, shipping big crates of new products to Shanghai. 60% of their products are sold in other parts of the world with Made in America stamped on it. That's the future for us. And yet, they have to do nine weeks of special training in order to get people prepared to do these manufacturing jobs. Now, that's a wonderful public-private partnership because they're working with the Community Technical College over there to get that done. But what I'm saying is, we've got to be delivering young people 
and people who are getting re-educated, people who are getting re-employed into the marketplace with skills to work together, to understand computers, and to be able to be a part of that 21st century economy. So education, innovation, research and development, and infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, the highways, and the telecommunications that we need. Here's what's cut in the Ryan budget. Education, innovation, infrastructure. Honestly, and then they're gonna be surprised that we can't pull out of a recession. Our economy's gonna go right, right downhill from there. We cut 10 million students uh, with Pell Grants. That's an entire slice of the middle class who won't be able to attend college and won't ever see that opportunity. This one breaks my heart. 200,000 children from Head Start and 400,000 children from early childhood education. If you know anything about child development, you know that these little kids need help to learn their numbers, learn their letters, line up, put their backpacks on so they can go to first grade and learn the math and learn the reading that will put them on a path to the skills that they need. The fastest growing part of state government, prisons, right? So let's help these kids to get a decent start in life. And then the cuts go on from there. Research and development, innovation, 20% cut in renewable energy. Renewable energy is the future for our economy. Make us less dependent upon foreign oil and save the planet. But that's what they want to cut. And the list goes on and on. Family planning eliminates family planning. Planned Parenthood clinics will close all across the country. This is what this budget does. Now, it would be one thing if that was the sacrifice that was required because of these terrible deficits. If we were all coming together as a people to address the deficits, which we need to do, and to balance our budget, that would be one thing. But this is the worst part, the most insidious part of this entire production with this Ryan budget and the whole Romney, Ryan, fast plan. It doesn't balance the budget and it doesn't end the deficits. Why? Remember fairness? They don't believe in it. So here's what they do. They add an additional tax break of $265,000 for millionaires. And it goes up, up from there for billionaires. I mean, think about that. I said in the debate that $250,000 is a nice lifestyle in New Hampshire. And I wanna keep the tax breaks for all of us in the middle class up to $250,000, everyone will get that tax break, even the millionaires, up to 250. Beyond that, I think people can pay their fair share. I don't think it's too much to ask. And frankly, we hear in the news, a lot of folks making a lot of money who are willing to pay their fair share. I'm all for entrepreneurs. I believe in people who start their own businesses. But I also believe that these are very tough times and that we've got to come together and deal with these deficits. So don't <coughs> let any Republicans tell you that they are trying to cut the deficit. They're not. They have zero credibility on this. Do you know how many people this involves in New Hampshire? This tax break for millionaires, and this is a million dollars in income per year, not assets, okay? One-tenth of 1% 1 of our population, 349 people. So I want to go to Washington to represent 99.9% .9 of the people. And I'm more than happy to represent the, the one-tenth of 1% 1 that are willing to pay their fair share. We can't afford the tax breaks for millionaires. We've got to deal with the deficits. Now, there are other ways to bring down the deficits as well. We've got to end the wars bring the troops home, start the nation building here at home, the roads, the bridges, the highways, the schools, the hospitals. America needs help. We've got to get our economy back on, on track. We also can't afford the tax breaks for oil and gas companies, for nuclear, for coal. We've got to level the playing field so that renewable energy has half a chance. For, so that investors will, it's not that we don't have great ideas, it's not that we don't have great technologies, it's that it's not fair. 
you know, Congressman Bass sits on this Energy and Commerce Committee, and this is the heart of what's wrong with Washington. His contributions for his campaign come from these fossil fuel energy companies. And don't take my word for it, it's public record at the FEC. Natural gas, coal, nuclear, oil, all the way down. He takes a vote, he gets a check. Or he takes a check and he takes a vote. And this is how it works down there. But here's the beauty of it. I'm going to be representing all of you because we did this very, very differently. And it's taken a long time and it's taken a lot of hard work and a lot of contributions from folks in this room and all across this state. But here's the difference. We have funded our campaign by individuals, real people, breathing people, not the corporate kind, okay? And here's what it means. We have 25,000 donors and the average contribution $53. So it comes in $7, $3, $14. We have a guy, a wonderful man, he's a bit challenged, but he's very, very helpful in our, in our campaign. He comes in almost every day. And every couple of weeks he says, I'd like to make a contribution. And I say, that's incredible, thank you so much. And he pulls out a $20 bill and he says, do you have change? <laughs> and we haven't figured out why, but he likes to give us $11.50. <laughs> and honestly, it just breaks my heart every time. It's so meaningful. He has benefited from the services. He showed, uh, I'm gonna get all choked up now, he showed me a, a book the other day of his life when he lived at the Laconia State School. He started out in an orphanage when he was a little boy. He's probably my age, it's hard to tell what age he is, but I'm guessing that he and I have lived in New Hampshire all these years together. And he knows what it means to have services for the disabled in our community. And so that's who I'm in this campaign for. It's for all of you. It's for families all across this state. And I am gonna fight for civility. I am gonna fight for civil discourse. I am gonna fight for opportunity and equality and liberty, and I'm gonna fight for all of you. And with your help, we're gonna win this seat and we are gonna send a message loud and clear. The people are taking back the Congress.